Everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Last Window, The Secret of Cape West, a uh, bonus. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah, so I think this should be like the final, final episode of everything because it would just be the second half of the classified uh, text files we're getting here. So basically, audiobook part two. Let's do it. Let's do it. Wow. Ooh, these tears are getting messier and messier. Okay, at least, at least he has the decency of taping them back up. Notes concerning Kyle Hyde, part six, Kyle's youth. Do we get to find out more about him being a boy scout? That'd be great, either way. Kyle Hyde's father died when he was nine years old, and shortly afterwards, he and his mother, Jeannie, moved to Manhattan. Hyde continued to live there for approximately 21 years, eventually moving away at the age of 30. I divided Kyle's life in Manhattan into three distinct time periods. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna get over how creepy and weird this is. So as to facilitate the research process. These categories are Kyle as a child, Kyle as a child, Kyle the child, that rhymes, Kyle with half rhymes, Kyle as a young man, and Kyle as a police officer. Over the course of my research, I learned that during each of these periods, there was a key figure in his life who had a great impact on his personal development. The first was a teacher he had as a young boy, Sarah Hartman. The second is Billy J. Coolidge, whom Kyle befriended as a young man, Finally, during his days on the police force, he was greatly influenced by his partner, Brian Bradley. My research inevitably took me to Manhattan at one point, and during my time there, I, uh, during my time there, I was lucky enough to be able to interview one of those key figures regarding the younger Kyle Hyde. Okay, is this uh, the Coolidge person? Yeah, I still see Kyle twice, maybe three times a year. The last time was about half a year ago, I think. I had a recording session in a studio in LA. And after work, I called him up late at night and dragged him to a nearby bar. Uh, Tony? I'm so confused. Tony was not one of the three names mentioned earlier. We ended up drinking right through the, right through till the morning. It's like that where, it's like that wherever I go drinking with the guy. We end up chatting for hours. This was the first recollection I heard from. Okay, Billy J. Coolidge, Kyle's friend of many years, when we met in an open air cafe in East Village. So yeah, I don't think we've heard of this character outside of here. Billy is a session musician. Okay, yeah. I don't remember hearing him talk about other musician friends in the past. Billy is a session musician with his own studio not far from said cafe, and his drumming can be, can be heard on albums by numerous well-known artists. He was also closer to Kyle than anyone else in their younger years. When I first met the guy, he was 16 and I was 18, but for a while, he lied to me and pretended we were the same age. He was a dirty little sneak back then, seems like something he would do to seem more impressive. They got to know each other when they were both working part-time for a Cool Pop delivery company. He loves Cool Pop, it's his favorite. It paid pretty well, but the minimum age for the for the job was 18. Ah! So for that summer, Kyle pretended he was old enough and worked there with Billy. The two of them soon became friends, and they subsequently, uh, best friends rather, and they subsequently went to the same university. Even now, with Kyle living in Los Angeles, their friendship continues uninterrupted. Aw, would have been nice to see little bits and pieces of this person throughout the games. He's never changed, you know? He's never been great at weighing up the pros and cons of his actions. When he sets his mind on something, he'll do whatever it takes and damn the consequences. He's ended up regretting it plenty of times. I've seen him get much more emotional than I'd have expected from a big guy like him. I gotta say, I was pretty shocked when he said he was gonna be a cop. Ever since he was 17, he'd always said he wanted to play the sax for a living, no matter what. Aw, maybe they bonded over that because, yeah, he ended up. This guy ended up being a drummer. Uh, Kyle's always expressed his love of of music um, throughout the games, so that that's that's sweet. So I guess maybe his dream transformed from when he was really young, uh, baseball to being a musician later. That's kind of cool. In fact, oh, Billy was the reason Kyle developed an interest in the saxophone to begin with. Aww, that's so nice. For Kyle's 17th birthday, Billy gave him a record that he was into at the time. It was a famous free jazz recording that many consider representative of the 1960s as a whole. Kyle became so completely fascinated by the sound of the saxophone on that record that he took all the money he'd saved up and bought a used alto sax and started teaching himself how to play it. Ah, I love these. I love these extra tidbits so much. It's so nice to imagine these things. The guy was a natural. After we started college, he sometimes got all the jasmine my pop knew to teach him uh, teach him stuff as well. 
but after the accident, he could never quite play as well as he used to. Wait, like a physical accident that he got to? Or when Kyle was in his third year of university, he suffered an event that forced him to give up on his dream. <gasps> Kyle! It all started when the elevator broke down one day in the old apartment building where he lived at the time. I might have told this story in a different series, or maybe one that's not even come out yet. Maybe I never told the story. Anyways, a super, super brief rundown. A uh, while, a long time ago in university, I was at this one building really late at night and I was working on art stuff and then I left and uh, it was on the second floor. I don't think there was an easily accessible set of stairs. Otherwise, I think I would have taken it unless it was locked behind a door. So I normally just took the elevator and I thought I got trapped. Um, I thought it was one of those classic situations. You get trapped in an elevator and it's really scary. I even pressed an emergency button on there because I think my phone, well, I had my phone, but I was like, who do I call for this? So I think there was like an emergency button. I did get in touch with somebody. I was talking to somebody in the elevator, uh, but it turns out I just had to press a specific button and it would open it. But I think the janitor like came in and got it open for me. Really scary, really scary. Like, I don't know, probably 10 minutes max of my life. Anyways. Uh, Kyle got in the elevator at the same time as a young boy called Daniel. They both lived on the sixth floor, and just as they were about to reach it, the elevator suddenly stopped with a clunk. Oh, yeah, the nightmare. Absolute nightmare situation. The moment he realized they were trapped inside, Daniel panicked. He started wailing loudly and had difficulty breathing. There was no emergency call button in that elevator, so he started banging on the wall with his fists and shouting for help. He knew he had to get that kid rescued as quickly as possible. The apartment manager finally heard Kyle's knocking and called the fire department, who managed to get them out of the elevator. Daniel was perfectly safe. It wasn't long before Kyle and Daniel developed something of a bond. But whether it was fate or simply coincidence, that was not the only calamity. Cal calamity? What did I, what did I just say? Only calamity to befall the two of them. Kyle had to rescue Daniel one more time. One day, Daniel was playing on his bicycle in front of the apartment building. How dare you? No, I'm just kidding. But when he noticed Kyle arriving home, he pushed down two hard on the pedal and sent himself flying towards the road. The brakes wouldn't work, so he was unable to stop himself. In the space of a second, Kyle threw himself into the bike and saved Daniel. But in, proce in the process, one of Kyle's fingers collided with the handlebars and was injured. Oh no! His finger still ached sometimes even after the injury had healed. And from then on, he just couldn't press the keys on the saxophone as well as before. Oh, Kyle. That kid was being left home alone all the time, so Kyle was always looking out for him. I doubt he regrets saving him, even if he did hurt himself doing it. That was the turning point for Kyle, though. That was when he started thinking seriously about becoming a cop. He probably had it on his mind already, though, if I had to guess. You know what happened, you know, what happened with this pop and all. I was eager to find out all I could from Billy while I had the opportunity to speak to him. He was kind enough to tell me numerous stories about Kyle's love life. I'm curious about that. How is he with women? Because there, there was a descriptor before that, oh, he don't, he don't like women that whine too much, you know, but eh. As well as anecdotes about Kyle that no one else would know. The last story he told me before we ran out of time was something I hadn't quite expected. It was about a musician. Hmm, when was it? I forget exactly, but Kyle sent me something in the mail that was a real one of a kind. I mean, it was just a tape, but I couldn't believe what was on it. He just said it was as uh, he he just said it was a good track and I should listen to it. But when I did, I was shocked. It was a new song by Tony Wolf. Oh, this must be the hint part. The tape, which Billy still owned, had a label on it with a song titled Belief. Have you ever heard Tony Wolf's debut album? If not, you should really give it a spin. It'll give you goosebumps. Tony Wolf is a musician who gathered, garnered attention when he won a contest sponsored by the radio program Rock and Soul, which thrives on promo, uh, promoting new artists. His debut album, No Rock, No Life, was a huge hit that propelled him to stardom. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I've mentioned a couple times that um, my biggest inspiration mu uh, singer slash music musician is a Japanese American um, musician named Nano or Nano. And uh, I really love their work a lot, a lot. I feel like their songs are always extremely sort of um, inspirational. It's always about like, you can achieve your dreams and, and even if life beats you down, you can always get back up and there's always something to look forward to. It's, it's like, it's very motivational. It's like rock, J-rock. I love the sound of it. And yeah, her the thing that um, she says all the time is like rock on, and like a lot of that's always just in her albums and and titles and just kind of catchphrase. And I feel it, man. I feel it. You know, it's a classic. It's a classic thing, obviously. But 
I just heavily associate it with her just because I like her so much. Anyways, continuing. Tony's musical stylings were something no one had ever heard before, and his talent was 100% genuine. But it's the same old story. He started believing he could do no wrong and ended up in all kinds of trouble. Ah, the, the story from beforehand. Plus, there was that corrupt producer, the one who's infamous in the music business. Tony disappeared from the limelight, and I was pretty excited when years later, I suddenly found out from Kyle where he was now. Is this... Is this that f No, it can't be. The fan that Tony said he was gonna apologize to? Is that the same person? Are they implying that or is this not? Turns out they lived in the same apartment building and they were drinking buddies now. I couldn't believe it. Even after he gave up on playing the sax, Kyle still had jazz in every fiber of his body. It's just a part of who he is. In fact, I reckon he found Tony using his sixth sense for, for talent. Me and Kyle? I guess the best way of putting it is, we could go years without seeing each other, and then the second we were in the same room, it'd be like we were kids again, having jam sessions together. Now that's an interesting thing. I feel like that's something I've had to face and learn, um, especially over the past couple of years. No, uh, uh, COVID aside, it's also just like something I had to learn in, in, in terms of forming new friendships or relationships with new people. Um, some people have that kind of relationship or I have that relationship with some, some people, but not all, where I can go a long time without talking to them or seeing them. And when we see each other again, it's it's like, you know, it's like nothing changed and we can just talk to each other naturally and it doesn't feel awkward. Um, but I feel like with, with others, if I kind of don't talk to them for a while, I think there's like a term for it. It's like some kind of something degradation. It's like if you don't keep maintaining the relationship, then it starts not degrading really, but you know what I mean? Right, so it's just kind of interesting to think about those things. Uh, I definitely can't do that with everybody. I would think, I think for certain people, if I, I don't hear from them and if I keep reaching out and I don't hear back, then it, well, it becomes kind of discouraging. So it, it really, really depends. It's very case by case. So that's interesting to hear about this part because I have, I think I have the relationship with a particular person I have in mind. Billy wore a nostalgic smile as he finished speaking to me. That expression of his made me realize that for Billy, the memories he shares with Kyle are inextricably tied with his memories of youth. Is it the same for Kyle? I wondered. Ugh, I, I re I'm having a lot of fun with this. I don't know who even made it here. If you made it here, thank you so much. Um. I just, I just do all this stuff for the love of it because I think it's really fun and very cool. I don't really expect everybody to be as invested as I am, but if you're here for just straight up audiobook, thanks. Thanks for being here. All right, see you in the next chapter. Hello, and we're back. These chapters are getting really, really long. It makes sense because, you know, more and more stuff happens as it goes on, but it's pretty intense, pretty intense. Sorry that I'm not reviewing what's happening in each chapter, by the way. I mean, you watched the playthrough, you knew what happened. Okay, notes concerning Kyle Hyde, part seven, memories of Christmas. If you were to ask anyone about their memories of Christmas, there is a strong likelihood that they will begin to recount a story from their childhood. It's true. During my research into Kyle Hyde's youth, I interviewed his elementary school homeroom teacher, Sarah Hartman. She was kind enough to tell me about an event that happened shortly before Christmas when Kyle was 10 years old. Again, he is like an eternal old man to me. Uh, again, he's not even old. He's like, what, 30, 32? Um, but he just has old man energy. So him as a 10 year old, can't, can't imagine. When Kyle first moved to Manhattan, he was very quiet and kept to himself a lot. Even three months after he transferred in, he hadn't really opened up to me or any of the other students. His mother was very concerned about him at the time as well. I remember her coming to talk to me about him in her breaks. Miss Hartman, who was still a teacher at the time of my research, remembered Kyle well. I don't suppose it's too strange that he acted like that. He lost his father out of the blue and then had to move to an unfamiliar city. Of course he'd find it hard to come out of his shell. But I knew I had to be patient, that it was just a matter of time. Whatever Miss Hartman said to him, his responses only amounted to a word or two. She decided to try a slightly different tactic. Every Friday, she would choose a book for him from the school library and give it to him to read. Then, on Monday, she would ask him to tell her what he thought of it. Oh my gosh, it's like getting extra book reports, extra homework on top of that. I don't know if that's gonna make him like you more. That's more homework. At first, he just gave the books back to her without a single word about his opinion. One day, however, she tried giving him a science book to read. The following Monday, Kyle told her that he'd found it interesting. Huh, I don't, I don't know that he ever opened up about the fact that he finds science interesting. I don't think I've, we've heard him talk about him that much. After that, I searched the library for every science book I could find to lend to Kyle on Fridays. Little by little, he started using more words to tell me what he thought of them. After that, he started opening up a bit more to me and his classmates. Aww, <laughs> I would love to see a whole a thing about that. 
Wouldn't that be sweet? According to Miss Hartman, Christmas that year was when he finally became comfortable around her and the other students. That Christmas, I got my students to put on a bit of an event. I separated them into groups and told each group to come up with something they could present in front of the class that the others would enjoy watching. Some groups sang songs, some performed skits, and so on. Every group thought up their own little show. But you'll never guess what Kyle's group did. They conducted a simple scientific experiment posing the question, what happens when you shine a light onto a mirror that's been covered in clear red wrapping? Then let the light reflect onto a mirror covered in clear blue wrapping. Okay, the hint about, you know, tr we were trying to help uh, Charles with the film thing. What color does the light end up? They asked this question and then asked everyone to think about it. What do you think the answer was? The results suggested by Kyle's classmates were myriad and included the possibility that it would become purple, like when red and blue paints are mixed, or that the reflected light would simply become blue. The one who came up with the experiment was Kyle, of course. It was the first time he'd ever voluntarily raised his hand and presented an idea to the others. The result of the experiment was that the light disappeared entirely. Light is essentially a mixture of various colors, each at a different wavelength. When the light was shined on the red mirror, only the red light was reflected, and when it was shined on the blue mirror, only the blue light was reflected. All the other colors' wavelengths were absorbed and thus disappeared. That sounds kind of crazy. I I'm having trouble imagining it. I'd have to see like a visual example, but it sounds pretty cool. Science, man, science rules. Thus, when the light reflected off the red mirror, uh, thus when the light reflected off the red mirror was reflected again off the blue mirror, all the light had been absorbed and it disappeared. Oh my gosh, science! It was a curious development, said Miss Hartman. No one had managed to guess the right answer, but the children were absolutely fascinated by this experiment. They'd really enjoyed it. That made Kyle so happy. Oh. <laughs> Kyle, my heart is warm. He smiled and laughed with such enthusiasm. It was the first time I'd seen him with a real smi a childlike smile. I still vividly remember how he looked at that moment. Oh. As a side note, the red wrapping that Kyle had used in the experiment was originally the gift wrap from a bottle of wine that Miss Hartman had received from her boyfriend. I was so sure that boy would grow up to be a science teacher or a researcher of some kind. And you say he became a police officer and now works as a salesman in Los Angeles? Oh, that just seems so strange to me. I just can't quite imagine someone as quiet as Kyle doing well in those lines of work. From her expression, Miss Hartman seemed slightly concerned about her former student's well-being as we finished our conversation. I heard about another of Kyle Hyde's Christmas experiences from Billy J. Coolidge, a friend of Kyle's whom you may recall me mentioning earlier. Christmas 67. Kyle was 21 years old. By that winter, he was getting to be quite the gentleman by his standards. All her doing, of course. Kyle had a girlfriend at the time. Her name was Christine, and they were in the same year at university. According to Billy, she was the one who taught Kyle the meaning of the word love. Billy told me an anecdote about Kyle and Christine's relationship. Those two got along pretty well, but they argued all the time, you know? Uh, those two things, I don't know about that. It was kind of cute in a way. I feel like this might be an outdated view, because like, you know, for, for a certain period of time, it's like, oh, there's this big trope of like, husbands, oh, I hate my wife, haha, <laughs> that is so funny, and like, and like, oh, it's normal if we argue, it's like, wait, you guys don't argue? Oh, what's wrong with you? Like, that's unusual. So I think it's just like this outdated view of toxic relationships just kind of being normal, and it's like normal to not like your spouse. Uh, it's not, by the way, healthy relationships are where you communicate. Arguments inevitably happen, but they shouldn't be like super frequent or super all out. I don't think that's normal. Okay, anyways, oh, relationship advice over, or maybe continuing, depending on what they tell us here. This one time, he forgot about a date they were supposed to be going on and got home real late with one of his buddies. It was unreal. The mirror in his room had the words, how dare you forget about our date? I hate your guts, scrawled on it in lipstick. Yeah, see, that's too much. It, de it depends on like if he did it frequently before, if they just never communicated, but like that's unhealthy. That's not cute, that's not funny, it's not quirky, that's really scary. And they should have definitely talked it out. He was wrong, he was definitely in the wrong. Uh, but they could have just talked about it, you know? Anyways, um, well, the buddy was me, actually. <laughs> I was kind of worried for a moment, then I noticed that after all those scary red letters was a kiss mark. I figured it was just a little in-joke between the two of them, and thank goodness for that. Uh, it's pretty weird. Waste of lipstick. Who's gonna clean that all up? It's kind of scary. I don't know. I'm not... I mean, whatever works for them, but just seems like an unhealthy relationship. But as Kyle was to discover, sometimes fate stands in the way of true love. Are you sure it was fate? Are you sure it wasn't just lack of communication? <laughs> it was Christmas Eve, and Kyle had arranged to meet Christine that night in front of Rockef uh, Rockefeller Center. 
He even arrived exactly on time. But by then, she was on her way to the hospital in an ambulance and she was in critical condition. Oh my God! Christine was killed by a stray bullet from a gun that had been tossed aside by a criminal during a police chase. Oh my God. Okay, like, don't speak ill of the dead and all that, but oh my goodness, holy cow. When Kyle got to the hospital, she looked at him one last time and then passed away. He says that Christine has lived on in his heart ever since that day. I asked him about it again the last time we met, actually, if he still loves her. He thought about it for a moment and then said, it's not so easy to say whether I love her or don't love her, but she's definitely still a real special lady to me. Anytime I think about her, I get all emotional. It still hurts to think about what happened. But whether that's love, hard for me to really know anymore. Kyle must have, ha uh, have Kyle must have a special someone again by now, though. That same day, he told me something else interesting. He said that Christine was the one who taught him about the turbulent emotions and deep sadness that love can involve. But he didn't learn how much joy and tranquility love could bring him until he moved to L.A. In any case, Kyle Hyde certainly seems to have a lot of Christmas memories that revolve around women. Yeah, I mean things with Rachel. Um, yeah, when you're young, you know, you, you don't know how to navigate things the easily and, and you have to learn by experience, right? And learn, learn by example and stuff. So, you know, I was, I, I was dumb and I still am in many aspects of learning to navigate how to interact in certain types of relationships, friendships, romantic relationships, etc. You know, we're all still growing and learning. Uh, so, Hopefully he's grown since then and learned from his experience, but yeah, anyways, anyways, okay, all right, next chapter. Here we are. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. oh hey, a, a cleaner line this time. That's good. That's good. All right, we're, we're controlling ourselves a little more. Part eight, view from the roof. Kyle Hyde has a special affinity for the rooftops of buildings. This is true. The rooftop of uh, Hotel Dusk was quite beautiful. It was cool to see the back of the sign, so I liked that. Uh, every apartment he's ever lived in has had a rooftop you could walk out onto, and he always tried to find hotels aha, fitting that description while away on business trips. Having realized this, I decided on one occasion that the best way to uncover the reason behind this might be to ask the person who knows him best. Him? Himself? Have you... I bet he's tried to interview Kyle, because he, he's so focused on him, right? But Kyle's probably like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk about my life. Get away from me. <laughs> so he's got, he's trying so hard to talk to all the people around him. I conducted a telephone interview with Rachel. Okay, all right. His colleague at Red Crown. Kyle's a fan of rooftops? You know, I'd never really thought about it. She giggled slightly upon hearing my question. But when you put it like that, I guess you're right. Whenever he went out on, bus on a business trip, he asked me if I could find him a hotel with a bar and a rooftop. This one time, I went out for dinner with him, and he told me what he does at night when he's away from home. Always the, sa always the same, he said. He goes to the bar and drinks three glasses of bourbon. Then if the weather's good, he stumbles up to the roof. Then he just stands there and looks up at the stars. And you know what else he told me? He said it's like you're just that little bit closer to the stars, and that I should try it sometime. You know, now that you've reminded me, maybe I will. Might give the bourbon a miss, though. Uh, she's, she's done like that. That ain't her taste. Kyle told Rachel another story that evening, and she was kind enough to relate it to me. When Kyle was a kid, he used to stand on his apartment's balcony every evening and wait for his mom to come home from work. Oh. From up there, he had a good view of the bus stop where she got off. But one day, she was late, and he waited there so long that it got pitch black. But when he looked up from the balcony, he could see the stars in the sky. He forgot all about the bus stop and just stared up at them, completely distracted. He told me that when he came to his senses, his mom was home already, and she was next to him on the balcony with her arms around him. That he didn't recognize, he didn't he didn't realize she was there, even though her arms were all the way around him, and he's like, uh, uh, oh my gosh, when'd you get here? How are your arms around me? She told him that one of those stars up there was his father, and that he was always watching him from up there in the sky. That was the only time Kyle ever talked to Rachel about his childhood. Kyle has never really talked to me about his past all that much. Honestly, I don't feel like it's that big of a deal. If and when he wants to talk about it, that's up to him. Unlike you trying to pry into his childhood with every little detail. As she told me this, there was something about Rachel's voice that had an intangible kindness and calming quality to it. There is one more person with whom Kyle has discussed the matter of rooftops his uh, wait, what? The matter of rooftops? Oh, okay, colon. His neighbor at Cape West, Dep Cape West Apartments, Tony Wolf. So, one night, I forget when it was, but I think I was having trouble writing a song or something? Yeah, that's right. It was real late, too. After midnight. 
I went up onto the roof for a change of scenery, hoping it would help me get my groove back, and who shows up but Senor Hyde? I was just leaning my, uh, with my elbow against the railing, staring into space. Didn't even notice he was there straight away, you know? They kinda tapped me on the shoulder and said hi. I totally wasn't expecting it, and I somehow ended up losing my balance and falling backwards a bit. Was pretty scared there for a moment. Thought I was gonna go overboard for sure. But Hyde got, but Hyde grabbed my arm tight and pulled me back up. I mean, he saved my life, but it was still pretty dangerous. That night, Hyde told me a story about when he was a cop. He chased this criminal onto a rooftop, and the guy ran right to the edge and was about to jump. But Hyde persuaded him not to and managed to arrest the guy instead. He made a connection to him, right there on the roof. I thought it was gonna be like an action movie jump, where like you were leaping from rooftop to rooftop, but it sounds like it was the, not the, not the as exciting type of it. As stories go, it was kind of gritty, like you'd see on a cop show. The guy he was chasing was a three-time killer, and he had a gun. If Hyde had made a single wrong move, got him too excited, it could have all gone downhill and fast. When Hyde told me all that, I thought, man, this guy really is a detective. Before that, I was always thinking as if a guy like that could be a real cop. You know what else he said? Whenever he goes up onto the roof, he always remembers the day he arrested that criminal and what he was like back then. He said that when he thought back to his days as this reckless daredevil cop, he kind of liked the memory of it. Sounds like he was pretty cool back then. As I listened to Rachel and Tony's stories, I felt reassured in my initial deduction that Kyle is fond of rooftops. They hold a greater significance to him than the, simply the beautiful scenery that can be viewed from them. When Kyle stands on the rooftop, he sees something else entirely. All right, next chapter, we're almost there. Let's go. All right, the penultimate chapter. Let us take a look. Open up. Bum bum bum, open up. Part nine, Detective Hyde's case files. I'm currently researching Kyle Hyde's many achievements as an officer in the NYPD's 89th precinct. He was on the force for approximately eight years. And while it would be, of course, while it would of course be impossible to find out everything that happened to him during that time, I would nonetheless like to learn as many small details as I can about his former life as a detective. As a part of my investigation, I have come into the knowledge of certain details regarding <gasps> Brian Bradley, another former detective whose name has appeared repe repeatedly in my notes, where I have typically described him as Kyle's partner. Bradley and Kyle were both on the police force when the organized crime syndicate known as Nile was being investigated in 19 six, uh, 1976. Bradley went undercover as part of the investigation, but he was secretly feeding information to Niall, and when the NYPD ultimately realized that he had betrayed them, they went after him. The last police officer to see him was his close friend, Kyle, who apprehended him on a pier. Bradley was shot by Kyle, and he fell into the water. He remains missing to this day. That cutscene played over and over and over again in the first game. I mean, it is a very, it, it's, it's what triggered the whole events of the first game, so it is important, but I remember just they kept replaying it. It's like when they play a flashback too many times in a TV show or something like that, it's kinda like that. I spoke to Willie Taylor, who was supervisor to both of them at the time, about Kyle and Bradley's relationship and the aforementioned incident with Bradley. All these years later, I still believe Hyde never had a better partner than Bradley. They were eternal rivals and unbeatable allies, and that's what you really need in a partner. When Bradley was gonna go undercover, no one was more against it than Hyde. And when the investigation started, no one provided more logistical support than Hyde either. That's why, when it turned out Bradley was ratting us out, everyone could see the bitterness and rage in his eyes. When I heard that Hyde had shot Bradley, I wasn't surprised in the least. I know exactly what he was thinking that no one could take Bradley down but him. That's why nobody stopped him. When we didn't find Bradley's body after he fell off the pier, and the higher-ups told us to shut down the investigation anyway for whatever reason, Hyde handed in his badge straight away and said he was gonna find his partner by himself, and nobody tried to get in his way. I knew there must be something more behind what Bradley did, and I knew Hyde was the only one who'd be able to find out the real story. In the end, Hyde learnt the truth behind Bradley's betrayal and disappearance at a hotel on the outskirts of LA, three years after leaving the NYPD. Detective Taylor was also kind enough to tell me about the first time that Kyle and Bradley worked together. The first case they ran was an investigation into a group of art thieves. The scene of the crime was this art museum in the tr tri tri Tribeca? Tribeca? That probably stands for something. Tri I don't know. Tribeca neighborhood. Tr Tri-state? I don't know. I think they'd stolen a painting by Osterzone. Yeah. Hmm, what was it called? Oh, yeah. Now I remember. It was called Angel Opening a Door. Yeah. 
Ostrazone was this genius artist who died pretty young. I remember hearing at the time that painting was worth an absolute fortune. According to Detective Taylor, Kyle and Bradley tried to ascertain the, uh, ascertain the means by which the criminals had been able to sneak into the art museum late at night, but they were unable to find any trace. It was then that they conceived of a different method of investigation. They went to the museum one night, at the same time they conjectured that the thieves had broken in, and investigated the surroundings thoroughly while the lights were off. In doing so, they discovered a secret code drawn in ink on the floor. It was hard to make out in the darkness, but the symbol almost looked like a hummingbird. Bradley had been trained in code breaking, and he managed to determine what the symbol meant and thus reveal the criminal's method of intrusion. Although the, co Although the code seemed complicated at first, in the end, it was as simple as following the direction the hummingbird's beak was pointing. Soon, the mystery was solved. It turns out that the thieves had been breaking in via the service elevator, which was used to move the works of art into the museum. But that wasn't all. They came to realize that if one pressed the button to stop the elevator while it was between the fourth floor and the fifth, a secret door would open that was embedded in the wall. So those art thieves, somehow, the exact same method was applied to this, this random apartment many years later? What is this? It was an incredibly complicated method of breaking in, and the two police officers couldn't help admiring the unexpected attention to detail and organizational skills of the criminal group. They might have stolen all this priceless treasure, but at least they're pretty cool about it. At least their detailed plan was pretty awesome. The perpetrators still got away, though. They didn't get the Ostrazone painting back either, of course. But that was the only one. Hyde and Bradley solved every other case they worked on together. Every single one. After he told me this story, Taylor handed me a photograph. It was the only photo he had of Kyle Hyde and Brian Bradley together. I'll let you have it. If you're really going to be writing a book about Hyde, you better write about Bradley, too. If Bradley ends up reading it, I bet he'll try and get in contact with Hyde, long as he still thinks of Hyde as his partner, at least. The photo I was given that day now adorns my desk as I prepare to begin writing the story of Kyle Hyde. With all the material I have gathered, it might prove to become a very lengthy tale indeed. Oh, man. Y'all ready for- I think this is the final chapter. I think because we had 10 in the game, should be 10 here, unless there's going to be a secret bonus bonus chapter. All right, let's see how he wraps things up. Okay, so there isn't um, a letter to open up. I it's just here. There's an epilogue here. So let's take a look. December 27th, uh, 1980, 6 a.m. Union Station. At this time of the morning, Union Station was almost devoid of human life. But in the expansive waiting room for long-distance trains, beneath the clock on the wall stood the solitary figure of a man. His name was Rex Foster, and he had been standing here for the past 30 minutes, staring intently at the entrance to the waiting room through his dark sunglasses. Rex was particularly irritated this morning, even by his own standards. He drew a deep breath, a quiet expression of said irritation. It was, he was mostly annoyed at himself. He had no idea if that woman would trust him enough to come here, but he knew he was the only one who could get her safely away from Niall's all-seeing eye. Marie! Rex glanced up at the clock, the hands already pointed to six o'clock, the time he had offered to meet her. Ten minutes. He would wait for ten more minutes, and if she hadn't shown up by then... Yeah, and if she hadn't shown up by then, he would leave. At the very moment those words took shape in his head, he noticed a slender form walking towards him from the entrance. He instantly recognized the figure's shape as that of a woman, and the clack clack of high-heeled shoes echoing across the marble floor could belong to no other. When she moved closer, he saw that she wore a long scarf wrapped around in such a way as to cover her face. A small handbag hung from her arm. She stopped sharply and darted her head around the room, as if unsure of coming too far into the room. He leant Leant, leant, lent, leant. Hmm. I've never seen it spelled like that. I would guess leaned, right? N E D. But oh well. He leaned against the wall and watched her for a few moments longer. But she didn't notice him standing there, so he walked over to her, and took off his sunglasses. I'm here, Marie. She jumped and spun around to face him. When she realized it was Rex, she replied with a firm nod. He placed a ticket for the next long-distance train into her hand, and then put his arm around her shoulders as they left the waiting room. He didn't let go, even as they passed through the ticket gate and made their way onto the platform. When they reached it, he finally took his arm away. And there, on the platform, he looked properly at her face for the first time. Her blue eyes were deep wells of uncertainty and doubt. Rex looked Marie straight in the eye and said, You have to trust me. We've got a bit of a long journey ahead of us, but waiting at the other end of it is your freedom. And until we reach that destination, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. That was the day Marie Rivet vanished from Los Angeles for good, and not a single person in the entire city knew where she had gone. 
Ooh, Marie. Oh, I'm so glad she could get out safely. Rex, thank you for holding up your end of the bargain. Not being a complete, complete, complete creepo is what I was trying to say. Good, good. Live your life. Absolve yourself of your sins. Repent. Live free. December 27th, 1980, 10 p.m. in Hollywood. The year was drawing to a close, so naturally, the bar was packed with customers that night. In that distinguished hotel bar facing the Chinese theater sat a stocky man clad in a checkered shirt. His name was Dylan. Ew, I don't want to hear, I don't want to read about Dylan. I don't want to read about Dylan. He could go fly away, far, far away for all I care. And though a simple glance might have painted him as a decent man, <laughs> in truth, he was an underling of the reprehensible organized crime syndicate known as Nile, a very incompetent one at that. This was the first time in a while that Dylan had drunk such high quality liquor, though he had perhaps enjoyed too much of it already by this point. He was getting more than a little tipsy. He knew exactly why the drinks tasted so good to him. It was because he was finally getting out of having to hide away in that apartment building, keeping tabs on everyone. Again, I don't get how he's able to get off scot-free and why he's just kind of chilling because he didn't do his job properly. In fact, he royally screwed it up and kind of like gave it away at, at the drop of a hat. So I don't really see how he's chilling right now and buying himself expensive liquor. If he's like drinking his sorrows away, that he's like, oh my God, I'm so screwed. I'm gonna drink and forget about it all. That's one thing. But he's enjoying himself right now and, 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 and buying himself high quality liquor and just, just chilling. So I don't get it. He'd been getting so bored of pretending to be someone he wasn't for so long, playing a role just so he could spy on people. As he drank to the bottom of his glass, he considered that it was almost like being an undercover cop. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And he had been in such deep cover that recently he'd started to forget who he really was. Who is he really? A piece of garbage? <laughs> when he left Cape West, he hadn't meant to follow that guy's advice. Still, he knew that no matter how much of his life he'd signed away to Nile, the people at the top regarded him as nothing more than a pawn. Maybe now really was the right time to move into a new field. Would they just let him go though? Would they just let him go if they, we're gonna try to hunt Marie down to the ends of the earth. Hunt down any anybody involved to the ends of the earth. There's no way they're letting this guy just find a new vocation in the same city, L work at the pizza parlor. Like, <laughs> there's no way, right? Another drink, inquired the bartender upon noticing his empty glass. Sure, why not? Surprise me. While he was waiting for his order, he stood up and went out into the hotel lobby, where he entered a number on the rotary dial of the payphone in the corner. After several rings came a click, and Dylan was met with the almost robotic answering machine greeting, asking him to leave a message after the beep. Beep! Dylan was dumbfounded. Hadn't the fool told him to call tonight? And now he wasn't even waiting by the phone! He was so annoyed that he couldn't help but laugh bitterly, but he quickly stopped and considered his words. Mr. Hyde, it's me. He spoke down the line, slurring his words a little. I just can't stomach being around a weirdo like you anymore. Just forget all about me. If you keep my secret, then I won't tell Niall about any of your snooping around in the apartment block either. But if you say a single word about me to anyone, a single word. His tone was growing more agitated, but he only got that far before there was another click, followed by the sound of a tape rewinding. Then the line cut off. Uh, what was that noise? Wait, what, what was it? <laughs> Dylan traipsed back into the bar, where the bartender had prepared his drink in a shaker. The bartender is secretly a member of Nile, isn't he? He placed a cocktail glass on the bar and poured the drink into it. Then he garnished it with a strip of lemon peel and topped it off with an olive skewered on a cocktail stick. Dylan took a sip of the drink and nodded in satisfaction. Then he looked up at the bartender and posed him a question. Say, tell me, did it take you long to learn how to mix a great cocktail like that? Is he gonna just casually become a bartender? That night, Dylan left Los Angeles for good? Nile has never been able to trace his where, but he's just that... He's just that good at disp- Okay! All right, what else, I guess? Go live your life. Just stop bothering Kyle Kyle and co. Okay, well, jeez. Jeez, I didn't need to hear about any of that. I didn't even care. <laughs> All right. January 26th, 1981. The next year, correct? 3 p.m., downtown. It was a Monday afternoon, and the park was filled with the carefree voices of children playing. Just beyond the park, a car pulled to a stop, and a single man stepped out. His name was Kyle Hyde, don't wear it out! And up until the end of the last year, he had lived in an old apartment uh, apartment building just a few blocks from where he now stood. Oh, okay, a year later. Hyde walked through the park and over the crossing on the other side. He was headed for the place he had lived for those four years of his life since moving to LA. As he walked those familiar streets, he couldn't believe, oh, a month. 
a month. Ah, because it's the new year. It's the new year. Me dumb. Uh, it, he couldn't believe it had only been a month. He turned a corner and there it was. In place of the building he had called home was a construction site, a construction site surrounded by a tall fence. He peered in through a gap and he could see that at least part of the building had been demolished already. In fact, it looked like the entire lobby section was well on its way. He walked around the back of the building and, excuse me, saw that his own apartment was still intact, as was the lighthouse monument on the roof. Suddenly, a voice called out to him, Mr. Hyde! Hyde turned around. He was met with a face he had missed seeing every day, one wearing the same cheery smile that always suited it so well. Claire, it's you, he replied. It's me! Never thought I'd run into you, though. Do you come around here often? Nah, this is the first time I've come to have a look since moving out. Same here, but for me, it's the last time, too. Claire's time as a waitress at the, at the cafe on the first floor was over now. She was moving to Boston along with both her parents, she explained. I'm, I'm glad things, I'm glad the parents could work things out with each other. I'm glad. I hope that things are going smoothly and they're communicating. It's very important. Are they opening, uh, are they opening a new cafe? Yeah, near where my mom grew up. It's a little on the small side, but I don't mind. Sounds good, mused Hyde. Be sure to stop by if you're ever in the neighborhood. My dad will make you a California burger just the way you like it. Claire ran over to the fence and took one last peek in at what was left of Lucky's Cafe. Then she said, Well, I've got to go. I hope I'll see you again sometime. Uh, uh, I hope I'll see you again sometime, Mr. Hyde. After Claire had gone, Hyde stood and stared up, uh, stared up for a while at the last window, at that last window along the fourth floor, the last window his father had ever looked out of. He didn't linger for too long before making his way back to the other side of the park. When he got back into his car, he looked out through the windshield and saw Claire walking along with Sydney and a middle-aged middle woman. He didn't recognize the latter, but he knew at once who she was. All three of them smiled warmly, as if the family had never been separated. Hyde reclined his seat slightly and let himself relax, and as he gazed, gazed upwards, he had the strangest feeling that there was something different now about the sky over LA. He wondered if all the people he'd become so involved with at Cape West just, once month, just one month earlier felt the same when they looked up at the sky. As he lay there, he felt his eyelids starting to grow heavy, and he allowed himself to slip into an afternoon nap. Before sleep claimed him, he was reassured by a single stray thought. Rachel will wake me up again. I can be sure of that. The end! Is that truly the end? Is that truly- Oh! Wait, there's one last thing! There's one last thing! Let's take a look! Let's take a look! <gasps> Ooh! Uh, ooh! Uh. Okay, here we go! Timeline of the events surrounding Cape West Apartments. Here we go. Let's run it through. 1950, Hotel Cape West opens. Michael McGrath becomes the hotel's manager. November 1955, jewelry theft. The Scarlet Star Diamond is stolen from the collection of French jeweler Charnay by the group of jewel thieves known as Condor. December 1955, the plan to take down Condor is thwarted. After receiving some vital information about Condor, LAPD officer Frank Raver makes a deal with a safecracker known to him as Gregory, real name Chris Hyde, whereby the latter will sneak into Hotel Cape West and confirm the presence of stolen jewelry. The plan goes awry, and the safecracker is shot and killed by Michael McGrath. Chris's body is found. Three days after the plan to take down Condor fails, Chris Hyde's body is found by LAPD officer, uh, uh, is found by LAPD officer Ed Vincent. There are no clues as to the perpetrator, and the case is left unsolved. The diamond disappears. Michael McGrath tells Condor ringleader George Patrice that when he killed the safecracker, the Scarlet Star was already missing from the safe. Frank Raver is denounced. After Chris's death, a ploy by Frank's colleague, Hugh Speck, leads to Frank being pulled off the Condor investigation. October 1967. The link between Condor and Nile. Los Angeles Beat columnist Jack Green writes a piece entitled The Truth Behind Condor, intended to be the first in a series of articles revealing the link between Condor and the organized crime syndicate Nile. The death of Jack Green. Jack Green is killed in a car accident. His colleague Rex Foster feels the death is suspicious and begins investigating. November 1967. Rex's expose. Rex writes an article asserting that Jack's death was caused by a crime syndicate. However, it is dismissed as fiction and he is forced out of the industry. Closure of Hotel Cape West. Michael decides that he will be closing Hotel Cape West. He tells George that he intends to wash his hands of the hotel and all of Condor's dirty dealings and moves to the countryside. Rather, and move to the countryside. December 1967. 
Kathy McGrath's murder. A party is held at the hotel on the, on the day it is due to close, during which George secretly brings Michael's wife Kathy to room 404 and poisons her as a lesson to Michael. Kathy's ring goes missing. One of the people who discover Kathy's body is hotel manager Pike, pff, I was gonna say Pike Mortar, Mike Porter, older brother of Marie. Before informing anyone about Kathy's death, he steals her ring. The investigation into Kathy's death. Kathy's death is initially considered to have been a suicide. George's murder. After George tells her about murdering Kathy, his wife, Margaret, feels great animosity towards him and resolves to kill him herself. However, that same day, Michael breaks into their house and shoots George instead. Michael knocks Margaret out, places the gun that killed George in her hand, and then leaves. The death of Mike Porter. Mike Porter dies in a car accident. His sister Marie is the recipient of a sizable life insurance payout. 1968. Marie gets married. Marie marries her brother's friend Peter, who has become a great source of comfort to her. The George Patrice murder trial. Margaret becomes the number one suspect. Margaret becomes the number one suspect in George's murder case, but there is insu Ugh, I can't read. But there is insufficient evidence to convict her, and she is found innocent. The day, the day of the verdict, she uses the money left to her by George to buy Hotel Cape West. December 1968. The renovation. Margaret has the hotel renovated into an apartment building. Cape West apartment opens for business. 1977, Michael's death. Michael McGrath passes away after a battle with illness. 1980, Peter's death. Marie's husband, Peter, loses his life in a car accident. Speck runs for mayor. Hugh Speck announces that he will be running as a candidate for mayor. December 1980, eviction notice. Margaret Patrice, manager of Cape West Apartments, sends eviction notices to all of the residents. Kyle Hyde loses his job. Due to his general lazy attitude, Kyle, Kyle Hyde is fired by Red Crown. When he arrives back at his apartment building, he almost bumps into a woman in a black hat and sunglasses who's walking out of the front door. And that's where it all began. And that's where Last Window, The Secret of Cape West began. Let us close the book once and for all. Nice. We did it! This was a, a more lengthy bonus episode, but we got through everything the game had to offer, you know, except for literally rereading the summary of the entire game, but we got, we saw some extra content. We learned a lot about Kyle Hyde. Everything I could have wanted and asked for, because I always wanted to know more details about his life. And fortunately we had this, this author very creepily invested in, in every single aspect of his life and dug up all the dirt for us to, to, to find out. <laughs> And so we found out many things about uh, different stages of his life, likes and dislikes, how he came to be in certain situations. And, and it was really, really nice. It was like reading fan fiction almost, just like all these aspects of, of, of a character's life you wanted to know about in, in the main canon story, but they, they don't have time for that. They don't give it to you. So it's like, fine, I'll do it myself. So it felt a little bit like that, but from a loving place and, and I appreciated it, so. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much for joining me. If you even made it through this episode, thank you so much. Um, I know that I play a lot of games that aren't probably the most mainstream or interesting to, to many people, but uh, it's interesting to me and I enjoy it. So I'm really, really happy to have gone through this entire uh, story and game. And uh, I'm looking forward to whatever I hop onto next. Join me next time. This is Axis, over and out.